Hey, so anybody know how many miles we've gone? How many kilometers? Okay, by the time we're done, we will have gone 5,000 miles or 8,000 kilometers. For a lot of you, this is your most mileage kilometers you've ever done on a cruise ship. And every single kilometer a mile has been on the ocean. So that's why I've been stressing oceanography in the last few days. And this is all about the oceans because, after all, we've been on the ocean, right? We've seen a lot more ocean than land. Uh, but it's been a great journey. We've been to, what, three countries and two continents. How many people was it Antarctica the first time there? Almost everybody, right? Yay. So uh, anyway, so oceans. Oceans, I t as you know by now, I teach oceanography. And I spent a whole week on this but I got 40 minutes to cover a whole week. Ready? Get, get out your pens and your computers, okay? And no cell phones, no, just kidding. Um, all right, here we go. Oops, I think. Now we go. Okay, so you may know this, but the Earth is over 70% ocean. So why on Earth do we call it Earth when Earth means land? It's our cultural bias, the original cultural, cultural bias. Okay, so, and all the oceans are connected, right? So the Mediterranean Sea and the, Medi and the Caribbean Sea and the, I don't know, Cook Inlet, all these places you hear about, they're all the same seawater. And they're mixed by this great current that we've crossed twice in the most calm crossings I've ever had. Let's applaud the, the weather gods. Yeah, that was amazing. I don't think I used a railing all week. <laughs> Oh, that was incredible, but I got to buckle up for next week. All right, so um, anyway, this is where almost all the water is. I think you learned that back in fourth grade, um, is all the water eventually goes down the ocean, then evaporates and comes on. This is our repository. So oceans are really important for our life. I'm going to cover just uh, some for five minutes, some for a little longer. These seven issues, I had to boil it down from a dozen down to six or seven. And we'll see, uh, we've already, heard a lot about uh, number three, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on number three. But anyways, I want to pick your brain so that you maybe go home and start Googling some of these issues, maybe get involved with some community groups or some uh, you know, nonprofit groups you might hear about. It's just something to think about. It's span your brain that to over two-thirds of our oceans I mean, our, our Earth is oceans, and our knowledge is about as much as we know about the moon. It's a very famous quote about oceans. We know more about the moon than we know about the oceans. Okay, this one I'm sure you're aware of. It's the most famous one, so I started with it. And the most famous pollution is oil pollution. Oil pollution is really bad, and half of the great disasters have happened from tankers that have uh, that have collided with rocks or with other tankers, believe it or not. Uh, but oil platforms are another one. And it's, they're like earthquakes. They're not the major source of pollution, but they get all the media. Uh, airplane crashes, earthquakes, they get all the media. But the, what kills the most amount of people are like car crashes and, and drug overdoses, things like that. So this is the, the uh, plane crash of the <laughs> environmental world. It, it's bad, it coats the birds, as you see in the lower diagram. It co coats the birds, and a lot of the birds rely on oil to stay afloat. And if you put oil on oil, you're basically ruining their ability to stay afloat, not to mention to breathe. Okay, oil tanker spills, if you're old enough to remember, the Exxon Valdez was the worst one. And, and it was a problem, though. I'm gonna bring something new. If you already know about it, you don't know this, you may not remember. It, it was in a cold climate, as cold as Tierra de Fuego and Ushuaia. And as a result, decomposition happened really slow, so there's still oil on the beach, um, under rocks. Um, if it happens in a warm climate, the bacteria decomposes it much faster. So that's something you may not have been aware of. Oil spills and pollution in general is worse in cold climates, like where we've been, um, well, not today, but <laughs> in the last week. And oil, when it gets into the water, there's certain things that happen. One is uh, the gasoline and the propane and the butane all evaporate, so you now you have air pollution and you have um, hydrocarbons in the air. But the, what's left over is tar, and tar can actually sink down to the bottom of the sea. The bottom of the sea 
is cold. And I haven't mentioned that before. It's almost consistently the same temperature everywhere in the world. If you go down a few hundred feet uh, or meters, the ocean is about 30, uh, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's about five degrees, four degrees Celsius. All over the world, and that's like a refrigerator, right? That's the same temperature as your refrigerator. Do things decompose in your refrigerator? No, anything you left in the refrigerator when you left is probably still good when you get home because things don't decompose when it's that cold. So this oil sludge or tar on the bottom of the sea um, stays for a long time. Okay, we have other spills. Almost everything you're wearing, yes, all your clothes, comes in containers. Almost all your computers, your toys, a lot of our food comes from containers. And this is, um, it's unbelievable. Do you want to guess how many of these containers fall into the ocean every year? You think 100? 20,000. And they go down, push, it's like a car crash on the sea, and out comes everything. Um, it's I mean, 20,000 a year. It's an acceptable loss. It's like whatever, one or two percent. And so that helps contribute. But the major co cause of pollution is rivers coming in from our crowded cities. It doesn't matter whether it's New York or LA or Tokyo or London, but there's a lot of trash coming in. And that is what we're dealing with. Uh, it's not people on cruise ships throwing plastic over. <laughs> it's coming in from other sources, and then the currents take it around. All right, who cares? Plastic's out there. Well, number one, it lasts four to 500 years. Just to put that in perspective, it lasts twice as long as the history of United States or Argentina. I mean, that's a mind-boggling number. All right, and then uh, here's one of our most famous diagrams in oceanography and marine biology. The lower diagram show, on the lower right shows the contents of a stomach of one albatross. And what are those things? Are those little tiny things? No, there's a, a Bic lighter in there. There's buttons in there. There's bottle caps in there. So that's from one stomach of one bird. Amazing. All right, this is a photo uh, taken by my friend Justin. Um, it was in National Geographic, if it looks familiar. And that's his claim to fame. <laughs> I'm the photographer who took the picture of the Q-tip. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Put that on top of your resume. OK. Uh, and what moves all the pollution around is currents. And I mentioned currents a lot. I particularly mentioned the Antarctic current, which is on the bottom, shown in blue, going from left to right. That's that great mixture of the ocean that makes all the chemistry the same. What I haven't been mentioning in public, but I've been mentioning to people, is this swirly pattern. You notice in the northern hemispheres, all the currents go in a clockwise fashion, in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, in all three oceans, uh, temperate oceans, it goes in a counterclockwise. This is one of the top 10 concepts in oceanography. Um, in my students, I, they've got to know this. The clockwise in the northern hemisphere in two oceans and counterclockwise in the southern oceans. And they move around, they determine so much, I don't have time to get in. I would love to have another lecture, and it would be where to travel based on climate. And ocean currents have a lot to do with it. If you see a blue current off the west coast of all the continents, that means it's dry and cool. I normally say like Los Angeles, but it's pouring rain today in LA. <laughs> but it's cold, it, you have to wear wetsuits to go in the water, but you have lots of marine animals. Everywhere you see a blue arrow, you have sea lions and seals. And everywhere you see red arrows, you don't have sea lions and seals. It's, it's really amazing determinant of, uh, but the red is where you get coral reefs. So anyway, I digress. Going back to the bad stuff. Okay, the currents concentrate garbage. And one of the things, I just asked a question just now about this. This is pretty well known. I guess it was on 60 Minutes in the United States. And it's the Great Garbage Patch. There's several of these garbage patches. There's two in each one of these swirly things. Um, and But the biggest one of all is in the Northern Pacific. Why? Because it's between the highly populated Japan, China, uh, on the west and the United States on the east. And it's called the Great Garbage Patch. But remember, there's more than one. This is the one that's most studied, okay? And I love this, 80,000 metric tons of debris. <laughs> do you know what a ton is? Do 
mean, it doesn't mean anything. It could mean this room filled up with trash. I don't know. <coughs> so what are these things? Well, we go out and study our oceanography <laughs> class goes out. And we, yes, we look at animals, and we sample the seafloor uh, sea mud. And, uh, but and one of the things we do is we look for trash. You sort of accidentally pick up trash every time you're trawling for, for some uh, surface, like for plankton, you pick up trash. You can't help it. So this is a kind of, um, the penny wasn't picked up. It wasn't floating. <laughs> the penny's for scale. That's just a coin uh, for scale. It's the other things that were picked up out of the when we were trawling for plankton. Okay, and then you may have heard of microplastics. If you haven't, Google it when we're done or when you get home. Uh, it, the microplastics are these tiny, tiny little, uh, they're like sand grains, but they're smaller than sand grains and they're made out of plastic. And we have two sources of them. One is that's how we ship plastic around the world. We don't sur ship them in blocks, you know, we, um, like we do with iron or gold. We ship them as little beads. The other is they're they, there was a trend, at least for a while, to put them in hand creams and soaps, and there's an environmental movement to get rid of these little, tiny plastic beads. There's absolutely no reason to have them in creams and soap. Soap, what happens to your soap in your shower? It goes down the drain, it goes to the sewage treatment plant, and it goes right through the plant, and it goes out to the ocean. So there's no need. Um, to have microplastics in soaps. It's ridiculous. Um, and so what can you do? You've heard this your whole life. Is, um, if you, um, in educated families, educated countries, educated societies, we know about this, but we have to spread the word. We all know people that may not have had parents that taught them this. Okay? And in the case of my students, I have a lot of students from around the world, and so it's really important for me to spread the word. Uh, there's something that, that because of environmental group pressure, um, companies like Amazon have been changing their packaging. There's also laws in progressive countries like England and progressive states like California. They're passing laws to get rid of plastic packaging. There's no reason to use plastic packaging in an Amazon package or, or McDonald's package, whatever. So that's happening. But this is where you come in. Just try to avoid plastic in general, you know, and to try to use a reusable bag. I use a reusable bag on this ship, right? And so if you could do it on a ship, you can do it anywhere. Okay, so um, this, I was asked a question about this. You guys are asking the greatest questions. Someone asked me, why do you do this? You're retired, why don't you just sit on the beach? And I like, because I like the intellectual challenge when I talk to you guys. Just today, I've been asked about the inner core of the Earth. I've been asked about this. And I've been asked about um, the uh, southern lights, the uh, aurora uh, Australias. So I love these questions. Keeps me on my toes. It's either that or I sit around eating bonbons and doing crossword puzzles, right? So we don't want to do that. Okay, so um, this is, there's several nonprofits. The one I, I mentioned here is called um, something 101. <laughs> and, but there's several of these. I don't want to promote one or, but these are nonprofits if you want to join. They're nonprofits, they're looking for contributions. And they go out and they clean up. This one in particular went out and cleaned up um, it, uh, the great garbage patch. It came out of San Francisco. And it's um, like clean up 101, but there's several of them. And the map just shows the route and where the garbage patch is compared to the United States and Mexico. The rainbow is just for beauty. <laughs> All right, uh, we have these coming out of rivers. I already mentioned places like New York. Now today, it's pouring rain in LA, the biggest storm of the decade. All right, so any trash that's anywhere in Los Angeles, anywhere in the whole metropolitan area, 15 million people, is pouring into the drains and it's, where's it going? to the ocean, there's no straining. It's gonna be a mess. I wouldn't even walk on a Southern California beach for the next week. Everything from hypodermic needles to mattresses are gonna be on the beach. And so this is something we can do, you can do, is get your, if you live in a coastal city, get your local government to put straining devices in. It's not that difficult. It's not like a flood control barrier or anything. It's just a, a chain. Okay, so plastics. 
if you view it as an ecosystem thing, the plastics are destroying the fish. But in reality, the fish are eating the plastics. All right, number two, overfishing. Overfishing is a big subject. I've been talking to several people about that. We are basically killing one species at the time. Same thing we did on land during, let's say, the 1800s. You know, first you kill the deer, then you kill the bison, and then you kill the bears. And we're doing the same thing in the ocean. When, we, when us old folks were young, we, everything we ate was cod. Fish sticks were cod, and McDonald's fish fillet was cod. Then we overfished the cod in 1991. No more cod, so now we moved on to Pollock. <laughs> and then, um, so this is the story. And um, so the reason is, is the technology is getting better. We live in a high tech society. You don't have little fishing guys going out, pop, 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 like you see in the movies. These are big, huge ships. We saw some of them at Punta Arenas. They're big, they're like half the size of this ship. You could put them inside this ship, but still, they're big, they're refrigerated, they go out. And the ones we saw at, in Stanley were coming in after being out at sea for like a month. They were full of fish, and they export them from Stanley on con in refrigerated, refrigerated containers. The nets are huge. The diagram on the right is just showing you what we do. And fishing's not wrong, it's just you should be aware of it. And subsistence fishing is when people fish for their diet, and nobody has an objection, whether you're from a rich country or a developing country. The problem is with the commercial fisheries. We have eight billion people in the world, and a lot of cultures um, rely on fish as their main source, not beef. Uh, but so, so there's a lot of fishing. <coughs> and then the overfishing also has a side effect Whereas to fish, most fishing is done with nets, and the nets will catch anything. So we're, we're mo the problem is they're throwing away 50% of what they catch. They say, they get this out and they go, that's not a pollock, I don't want that, and they just, it's dead. And yet you're killing a life. You're killing the source of food, maybe the food that the pollock eats is being killed. So 50% is bycatch, which is a easy name to say, wasted resources. Okay, and it also catches air-breathing animals in the net, like so dolphins. And anybody see the dolphins the last couple of days? I saw a few finally <laughs> after we came up in the temperate region. And sea turtles. We're getting warm water now, so there might be sea turtles. But they breathe air, so they get caught in the nets. All right. So here's a graph I want you to remember. I know there's a lot of slides, but remember this. The peak, I circled it in red at the top. The amount of fish caught in the ocean is actually going down every year. Did you know that? It peaked a long time ago. <coughs> and, it's, and why? Because we're killing all the wild animals in the ocean. <laughs> and we're moving over to the other species. Okay, And so you could see it peaked in 1988. Oh my god, <laughs> that was so long ago. That was before some of you were born, right? And it's going down ever since. And we have more and more fishing ships. It's not because we have less fishing ships, it's because we're catching more and more. And this crazy graph on the bottom is, shows that about 25, about one fourth of the species are gone. They're basically overfished. And so I mentioned cod. That was the backbone species for the whole Western civilization for, for thousands of years, it's, it's gone. And now the, the yellow bar, that has got to draw your attention, is another half are right at their breaking point. And that means, only, if you look at a pie chart, it's only one fourth that's left over, and that's the fish you should be buying, if you care about this, is buy the species that are sustainable. Okay, <coughs> you may not believe me, so seeing is believing, okay? So this is something um, we like to point out, these three pictures, okay? Three snapshots. This is black and white on purpose, so you get the idea of the era, right? So pretend this was taken when I was a little kid, you know, when I was born. Look at the size of that fish on the left, okay? Huge, the size of what? A human, right? Okay, now this would be like when I was in, was it high school? No, college. The fish, are they the size of humans anymore? No, maybe the size of a little kid. 
okay? And now, when I was teaching, they're the size, they're smaller than a cat, right? So this is what happens. So it's, um, it's evidence of pressure of when we hunt too much as a fish or any species is you don't have adults. And if you don't have adults, you don't have enough adults meeting each other and breeding, and then for the population goes down. A lot of it has to do with finding a mate and reproducing. Okay, so <coughs> something to think about. Most of the people in the room here will live to be till 2050, and this is an issue you're gonna hear about more and more. But we have so many other issues. We got invasions and, and other issues of politics and, and floods and everything that distract us, but this is ongoing. No matter what's happening with wars or politics, this is happening every day. All right, so something you can do about it is be a wise consumer. This is put out by Monterey Bay Aquarium. It's online. There's several organizations. I'm not promoting Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, but it's a nonprofit um, put together with a billion dollars from a high-tech guy. So it's no, nothing's more high-tech, I mean, nonprofit. There, there's no pro profit motive here. And they're basically saying the species that are good that you could buy and the species that are bad, okay? And so I just circled, um, uh, the green circle means good, the red circle means bad. I don't wanna discuss it now, but you, if you notice, on the right list, okay? I'm not saying a word about it. J and if you wanna talk to me about it later, um, here after the talk or um, up at HQ at four o'clock after Tori's talk this afternoon. Anyway, some very thought-provoking things here. We have a huge classroom discussion on this, but I don't have time for a classroom discussion. Discuss after the talk. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then the other thing is we have to enforce the fishing limits. Most countries do that. Argentina does that. They have a, the part of the Navy's job is to go out and make sure that the fishermen don't cross the border. Um, and uh, Peru basically invented the idea of fishing limits because they have the richest fishery in the world. And Canada enforces that. We all do. Um, it's in everybody's self-interest. All right, so here I want to bring up what the heck is this map? The oil spills? No. Nope. Are they war zones? No, 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 no. Look at uh, Australia. Australia is way ahead of everybody on this one. The United States is probably number two. What are these? These are marine reserves. And this is the easiest concept to teach, and it's happening. It's just happening too slow. And that is, our goal is to set aside ten, minimum 10% of the ocean, hopefully 30%. Um, within a century, and the idea is really simple. If you have, they're like national parks, state parks, county parks. If you have these parks, just think water parks, and you don't allow fishing, then what the adult fish or squid or sea lions can find each other and do what? Mate, yeah. And so, and then they can, the babies can grow up, you know, whether it's a marine mammal or a fish or a bird. And it's a really easy concept, don't you think? You can teach this to a second grader. And it's, but it's politics that's getting in the way. You could tell Australia because they care about their oceans, they're surrounded by the ocean, and, and the Great Barrier Reef is their number one tourist attraction, they're on it. The United States is um, on it where the fishermen don't complain. <laughs> so that would be like the Aleutian Islands and, and the far Hawaiian seamounts. But notice there's not many in the other states uh, the, on the West Coast. Where, and um, the biggest surprise is Peru, which relies so much on fishing. Peru and Chile, they don't have any yet. So anyway, this is ongoing. It's the optimism. Uh, several of you have asked me, are you optimist about the future? And yes, I'll tell you the positive of every one of these issues. And best news is this is happening. And nonprofits from National Geographic to the UN uh, to um, everybody, to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, are promoting this idea. This is brilliant. Okay, I've already talked about this a lot. Tori's mentioned this a lot, so don't worry. I'm only going to show you about four slides. I just want to bring you up to date with the ones that I haven't talked to you about. So these are new issues. Okay, uh, these are things. I'm going to mention hurricanes. 
I'm not going to mention currents because um, Tori already covered that. And I'm going to mention uh, north polar um, and sea level. Okay, this, um, you've already seen the graph, I think, without the big red uh, green arrow in it, right? And I want to point this out. Uh, several people said to me throughout the last two weeks, said, how can I convince my friends or, or my brother, and you know who you are, <laughs> yeah, and I've got a friend I travel with, and, uh, my oldest friend from high school, um, it doesn't believe in climate change. I think this is an easy, condensable reason. If they don't like graphs, to me the graph shows it, but I'm a scientist. Here's a really cool thing. Notice what happened in the 1940s. World War II. It was much bigger than this Ukraine war, right? The, how many countries were destroyed in World War II? Let's count them. Russia, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, China. They were all destroyed. And it, it, England, ha, UK survived, but a lot of their industry was bombed, right? Most of those, and nobody made cars for those five years. They were all making tanks and airplanes, right? So what do you think happened to the CO2? And you can see it on the chart. It went down. What happened to the world global temperature in the 40s? It went down. So that's a microcosm. And that's what scientists look for. We look for long-term trends over a century, and then we look for something like that. Like a, and so anyway, that's in a nutshell. That's why I included that. All right, something else I've talked to so many people, at least a dozen of you, I thought, I better put this chart up, because <laughs> I keep drawing it on the wall. How many of you had me draw it on the wall, <laughs> or on a napkin, or used my cell phone one time? And this is the one I'm referring to, and I find, I think I need to put this on my phone, because I talk about it every day. This is, for the people who can read graphs, this is the convincing argument. Nobody can deny climate change if they understand graphs, and I realize not all you understand graphs. These are the ice ages. There's been 20 of them. I only included the last four because it uses too much and it gets smaller and smaller. 20 ice ages, we've had the same repeating pattern over and over and over again because of the, the um, wobble in the Earth and the Earth's tilt, as some gentleman said during our question and answer period yesterday. But we should be going into a cooling trend. When I was in college, I took a course in glaciology, and one reason to take it is we thought we were going into an ice age. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna get ahead. And same reason I took Russian. <laughs> I thought Russia was gonna be the other superpower oh, my whole life. Man, was I wrong. <laughs> and man, were we wrong about this. Because what's going on? We're off the chart, literally, figuratively. When my students graph this, it's off the chart. They go, Mr. Holiday, I can't, it doesn't fit on the graph. I'm like, that's the point. All right, and it's going 10 times faster off the chart in the wrong direction than it should be. Go we should be getting cooler based on the Earth's tilt and the wobble, and we're going the other way 10 times faster. Okay, because I've been meeting a lot of people from Florida, I thought I'd throw this one in, okay? Um, what is the biggest destruction in Florida? It's not earthquakes, <laughs> it's not hurricanes, it's not thunderstorms, it is hurricanes. And I know because I went there right after that hurricane in October and to make sure that my dad and my sister's home survived in, um, near Tampa. We had avoid, avoided disaster. If it hit Tampa Bay like predicted, it would have been the worst disaster in US history. It would have been $300 billion of damage. Instead, it hit Fort Myers, so it was only like 30 billion. We avoided it just by sheer luck. And I would be talking about that hurricane and all the damage right now if it had hit Tampa. Instead, I'm showing you the one where it did hit. A ca Category 5 hurricane hit New Orleans head on and a predictable disaster. I knew it was gonna happen the day uh, because I had heard a talk in Louisiana the previous year and a professor had said in the talk, we will be destroyed if a category five hurricane hits New Orleans. And I said, wait, 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 stop the talk. So what, what did you just say? He said, we will be destroyed if a category five hurricane hits New Orleans. And I can, can't believe it, it happened within a year. So I walked into class just like this. I walked into class that day that hurricane hit and I said, you watch, New Orleans is going to be destroyed today. And that night it didn't happen. I thought, oh no, they're never gonna believe a word I say. And the next morning, the images started coming. People, you know, scrambling, saying, turn on the pumps. And by Wednesday morning of that week, the students came in and said, 
you're a god. You're predicted. By then we knew 1,200 people had been killed. And so it was a predictable disaster. So, by the way, is Tampa and Miami. Those are two of the three most predictable disasters. The other one, by the way, is interesting. A gentleman was just asking me about, what about China? Where's China and all this? China's number two on the list of destruction. It's that bay near Hong Kong. It's called the Canton Bay or the Pearl River Delta. That is as vulnerable as Miami and Tampa. It will be destroyed someday by a hurricane. Maybe not in our lifetime, but sometime. All right, sea ice. You heard all about Antarctic sea ice, right? Over and over and over again, right? And this is something that's new, and I haven't talked about it, and I didn't mention it on ABC News and all that kind of stuff, so, but it's even more dramatic in the north. And what is the poster child for climate change? The polar bear. This is what's happening. The polar bears retreating, receding. It's getting harder and harder to find them. They're living on land more. They're starving because their food source is on the sea ice. That's a whole other talk. There's a graph on the bottom for those of you who know graphs. That's, you can see it's going down on average arithmetically. There's no denial of that. Sea level is also is rising, as you can see. And th this is, I put these dates, I chose these dates because this is basically my career in teaching. I, when I started to teach, it was on the left side of the graph. And when I stopped teaching, it was close to the right side of the graph. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty good. And it's increased um, 100 millimeters. The problem here is it's not increasing arithmetically. It's increasing ge geometrically. And, and that means bad news, especially if you combine that with these other issues. Okay, need to give you a break, just a little <laughs> minute break. All right, so uh, you know we have wildlife. Well, when you work in Antarctica, you never know what kind of wildlife will pop up. <laughs> and as I was driving a Zodiac, this guy literally popped up and like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> and then of all the people in the Zodiac, he went over to the most famous person on the whole ship. She happened to be on my boat, and it's Kathleen Sullivan. I don't know if you ever heard of her, first woman to do uh, spacewalk in space. And so, anyway, I couldn't believe it. I said, now that's one smart penguin. Maybe he wants an autograph, Kath <laughs> Kathy. So anyway, that's pretty cool. And she emailed me later when I sent her. She said, it was one of all the things I've done in outer space and everything, that's my favorite picture. OK, here's something that Tori mentioned, I think, in our question and answer. Um, the, as we add more CO2 to the oceans, we're increasing the acidity. Why? Because if you add CO2 to water, like in soda pop and beer, it makes it acidic. Did you know soda pop has a pH of like three? It can dissolve a seashell. And that's what's happening in the ocean. I'm going to skip through that one. But I did want to see you on the, on the bottom. This is what would students write down. This is like one of the top ten concepts in all of oceanography. I would tell the students, this is definitely on the test. This is going to be a long answer. It's worth more than a short answer, OK? And uh, as you add CO2, whether you're adding it to soda or whether you're adding it to the ocean, you create more and more acid. And acid dissolves calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is what almost all the seashells on Earth are made of. And now we're not worried about the big clams. We're worried about the little teeny tiny uh, uh, plankton that feed everything, right? What feeds a krill? Plankton. What feeds a uh, herring? Plankton. And if their shells are dissolving, there's no more food, OK? And oceanographers are oceanographers. Um, this is our biggest worry. It, it's why? Because the media is not covering it. You never hear about it. And this is actually. If you're talking about marine biology, this is more dangerous than the warming trend, and a lot more important than the screwing up the currents. Okay, so if there's anything you get out of the talk, this is what I want you to know: acidity. Okay, and everything in the ocean relies on these guys. And this is the projected. I put a big yellow arrow so you know which one I'm. To look at the bottom uh, one, and you can see: is it going up arithmetically or geometrically? Geometrically, it's, uh, it's going up faster and faster. We, right now, we're uh, basically at the right tip of the yellow arrow, in case you can't see the numbers on the bottom. Oh, there we are. <laughs> I forgot I added the red arrow, sorry. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. All right, these are little micro, these are little buggers. Okay, this is what uh, the krill are eating. This is what the little fish are eating. And you probably heard of some of them, but you, the one, the most numerous animal on earth is on this page. Does anybody know? It's like a multiple choice question. At the upper right, they're called pteropods, and they have shells that are as thin as paper. Well, if you have acid, what happens to a paper thin shell? It goes away, yeah. So pteropods are, uh, the whole ecosystem of the ocean may collapse due to an animal you never even heard of. Okay, you see how thin they are? Okay, so the same solutions as for the climate change apply here. And one, I talked to several people, there is a way to fertilize the oceans, and we might have to do that. We might have to have a worldwide tax to fertilize the ocean, but that's in the future, and I'm not gonna cover it here. Here's one, if you're, we have Aussies, uh, from people from Australia, the number one tourist draw is coral reefs, and the same in Belize and Honduras and other places. If the temperatures go up, what happens is the cor coral is made out of an animal that has algae living in it. It's a symbiotic relationship, like, like um, lichens. And the most bizarre thing happens is that if it warms up too much, the animal kicks the algae out. <laughs> But the problem is the, an the algae is there for a reason. It provides food for the animal. And we don't know why they do this, but it, it happens. It happens when the temperature gets to be about 84 degrees, which is about 30 degrees Celsius. And it's cold bleaching because once they kick them out, they turn white and they're sick and they may or may not survive. And you say, oh, this might happen in the future. And wouldn't that be bad? Well, it already happened and it's happening faster and faster and faster. These tend to be on the news, but they're like buried in the news, and you're like, oh, I don't even know what that is. I don't care. Um, no Americans are dying, so I don't care. You know, or, or, you know, no Europeans are dying. Uh, but this is, it affect, the last one affected three-fourths of all the world's species, and so the coral may go extinct in our lifetime. We, d we don't know. It's something we're thinking, thinking about all the time. <laughs> and, um, so here again, same solution, reduce the CO2. And this is actually happening. I've seen, uh, I've read articles on it, and I've seen programs on TV and PBS and BBC on that there's a whole realm. This, there are jobs in marine biology. This is the future of marine biology, is trying to get the ocean to handle the climate change. Because uh, um, marine biologists can't stop the climate change happening, but we can do something about it. If we can get the funding, we can find spe uh, very, um, individuals that are handling the change and then you know, raise them in captivity and let them loose. Okay, the last issue I wanna talk about is nothing near as great, but it's, it affects uh, people who live along the coast a lot. Florida, there's always a bad red tide. It makes us cough and sneeze. <laughs> and um, it also kills life. And so, and it's all due to too much fertilizer. And you're like, well, who's out there dumping bags of fertilizer in the ocean? No, it's accidental. But it doesn't matter whether it comes, there's two big sources. Sewage comes in developing countries, it's sewage coming in, uh, places that don't have sewage treatment plants. In developing countries, it's fertilizer, as you will see. And if this uh, fer uh, fertilizer accidentally gets in the ocean, what it does in this complicated diagram, I spend a lot of time in this in class, but basically the nutrients give you massive algae blooms, whether it's a red tide or a green, it doesn't matter, and then they all die, and then when they die, the bacteria that decompose them use up all the oxygen, then all the fish die, and then, then you have even mess, and it can kill Oh my God, when this happens, it's amazing. It killed like 100,000 fish in one, in one harbor. And then it's a smelly mess. All the tourism stops and, and shops have to close and things like that. Okay, and how does it happen? Well, that's the Mississippi River drainage in a wealthy country, right? And that also, that map also shows where almost all the corn and the wheat and the soybeans in America are grown. So guess what? It's the, it's the fertilizer we put on the farms. And it flows down the river. Sewage treatment plants don't remove it. The soil doesn't remove it. 
and it goes down. The same in Europe, the same now in China. Now China's wealthy enough to have man-made fertilizer. This is a worldwide problem. And you can see um, when this map was made, it was basically it's a map of rich countries, right? It's because the richer the country gets, the more fertilizer they can afford, um, you know, more capital intensive farming. And the problem with capital intensive farming is you over fertilize. Now new GPS operated tractors are helping with this. They can reduce it a little bit, but it's still a problem. And I think it's, it's ironic, don't you think, that it's found in rich countries. Now I could show you an equally shocking one of the developing countries, the majority countries, you know, like 150 countries that don't treat the sewage, it would be the same kind of map, but it would be inverted. It would be everything you see dark on this map would not be dark, it would be the other. So it's sewage treatment, it's very important, and most of you are from North America and Europe, and even Argentina and Brazil, we treat our sewage, and this is the reason. Okay, so. The key is to cut back on nutrients, and that's what we're trying to get farmers to do. And the other one that you may not have heard of is, this is the other reason besides liking fish and birds and the pretty species that we find in wetlands, is to try to preserve wetlands and rebuild them. And in places like California and New York, we're rebuilding wetlands. They're so important. We're spending millions of dollars rebuilding them. And it's 21st century environmentalism. You might want to look it up in your local country, your local state. But rebuilding wetlands is a really big deal, whether you're talking about nature or just getting rid of this nutrients. It's the cheapest way by far. There's entire communities in the United States that have done this instead of putting treatment plants in. And it's pretty, it's cheap, and it's effective because the plants in the wetland remove the nutrient before the water goes out to sea. It's a win-win situation, and it increases tourism. You get more people to come. So I think that's it for the oceanography. I just want to conclude with, it has been great sharing your first journey to Antarctica, and I'm hoping you learn something, because Antar Antarctica is more than just cute little penguins, right? It's, and as we already said, you came for the penguins, but you're going to return for the val. Yes, ice, but also maybe you have a newfound appreciation of oceans. And maybe the next cruise you go, whether it's on NCL or another cruise line, maybe bring an oceanography book along. <laughs> you can buy used ones for like $5 on Amazon, okay? And, oh, and they're quite interesting. You can skip through the chemistry chapters and get to the fishy chapters and the marine mammals. But things like currents, I think it's a cool thing to do. Or you can download them on your cell phone. But it's, it's a different way to travel, especially, uh, you know, we're all into cruising, right? And it's something that you're, we're looking at it, we're going over it, we're seeing the waves, we're flowing it. And so think about that in your future of traveling. So thank you very much.